Um, I'm very happy to present. Our first presenter is Sarah. Um, so Sarah has been with the NIDA CTN for eight years, most recently as Senior Project Manager with the Greater New York Node at the New York University School of Medicine. She has served as the regulatory QA specialist on half a dozen CTN projects, including, this is a mouthful, CTN 47, 48, 51, 59, <laughs> 62, 79, and serves as the national project manager for both CTN 62 main study and the ancillary study. Sarah, ready to begin when you are. Thank you, Dagmar, uh, for the introduction and Thank you to everybody for joining today's webinar. So the objective for this segment of today's webinar is to outline the activities that study teams should consider during pre-implementation for the inclusion of prisoners post-enrollment in a study. It's worth highlighting here at the onset that today's discussion is for the inclusion of participants who become prisoners after study enrollment. So there's a whole different set of regulatory considerations for the actual enrollment of prisoners and which could be a potential uh, for a completely separate webinar. So as we are all aware in the research world, time is of the essence. So study teams are continually monitoring a study's progress by way of its timeline and the projections by which milestones are anticipated and accomplished. Efficient and effective study teams uh, plan and anticipate for as, as much as possible during the pre-implementation phase of a trial so that the study can keep to its projected timeline. There are a number of preparatory steps uh, that must be completed before a CTN study can be open for enrollment. And to name just a few, these include the development of the protocol and the informed consent, the identifying and hiring of staff, training, submission to your IRB, site initiation visits, and so on. Should teams plan for and obtain the required approvals for the inclusion of prisoners, uh, during pre-implementation, there are two advantages to be had. The first being less potential for missing data. So in planning for the inclusion of prisoners at the outset, teams will be able to conduct the follow-up interviews with those participants who become prisoners and for which data would have otherwise likely been missed. And this will, of course, equate to higher follow-up completion rates. And secondly, there will be less of a regulatory burden. Should the appropriate approvals be sought during pre-implementation, this will negate the need to both modify the protocol and the informed consent documents, as well as negating the expense and time needed for submission of a subsequent modification. In other words, if, if teams plan for as much during pre-implementation the onus of the work that will need to be accomplished further down the line will be minimized. So this slide shows a checklist tool that study teams may use to help with teams planning efforts during pre-implementation. And in the following slides, I will review each section of this planning checklist and address pertinent study documents, considerations that are specific to prisoners, and the process considerations. So pre-implementation planning considerations include the selection of a single in institutional review board, or SIRB, uh, and this afternoon, we will review questions that should be asked of potential IRBs in regards to their experience of reviewing prisoner research. The development of the protocol and pertinent language that will need to be included. The development of the informed consent form and similar to the protocol, what language will need to be included within this document. And finally, a review of the approvals processes 
hoping to shed some light on how a study submission weaves its way through the IRB and then through OHRP. So under the common rule, all NIH-funded multi-site studies require the use of a single IRB. And a single IRB is the IRB of record for all sites that are involved in a multi-site protocol. So when considering which IRB to utilize as your study single IRB, you'll want to consider what their experience is in applying for prisoner certification from OHRP. So some things to consider and questions to potentially ask of the IRB are, what are their experience with research that includes prisoners? Can they describe the certification process that they've had uh, with the Office of Human Research Protection? What's the typical length of time for the issuance of approvals by both OHRP and the IRB? How many prisoner, how many prisoner advocates are on the IRB? And are they voting members? How often does the board meet, which includes the prisoner advocate? The development of the protocol. The protocol will need to include language about the inclusion of prisoners post-enrollment. And as listed on this slide, topics that will need to be mentioned include specifying that prisoners will not be enrolled. Rather, the protocol should specify that should a participant become incarcerated during the study, treatment and follow-up procedures may be continued in accordance with local IRB approvals. Data may be collected either in person or by phone, in writing and or electronically. Details or, nature, or the nature of the research will not be shared with staff at the jail or at the prison. And finally, that visits, whether done in person or done by telephone, will be conducted only if the par participant's conf confidentiality can be maintained, that no audio recording will be done. And later on in today's presentation, Peter will review with us some ways by which confidentiality is maintained while study personnel is conducting a study visit within a jail or a prison. So similarly, the informed consent will also need to specify language about the inclusion of prisoners. The, con the consent will need to mention that the study team will want to follow up with the participant should he, or, should he or she become a prisoner, that their continued study participation will not have any impact on the participant's judicial proceedings. Continued participation in the study will not impact their criminal case, not going to impact their release from jail or prison, or have any effect on their probation or parole. Thirdly, that the interview will only take place if confidentiality can be maintained. In addition, the consent should note that the specifics of their, of their participation in this study will not be shared with jail or prison staff, parole or probation officers. And finally, the consent will include language on compensation, explaining that if the participant becomes a prisoner, they will still be able to receive compensation for their continued participation in the study. So some points of information that study teams should be aware of in regard to processes at the IRB include, when submitting, the submission must be reviewed by the board with a prisoner advocate. And of note here, uh, this could potentially add more time to the review process, as each review board most likely does not have its own prisoner advocate. The IRB will review the submission and determine the classification of prisoner research for the inclusion of prisoners post-enrollment. And teams should anticipate four to five weeks from the time of initial submission to approval 
It could be potentially more. This is a guesstimate, and it depends on the single IRB. And lastly, it should specify on the approval letter that OHRP review and approval must be obtained prior to study enrollment. So the Office of Human Research Protections, or OHRP, is the organization that ultimately approves the request for the inclusion of prisoners. So just providing some very broad strokes here about the processes. Once the IRB has reviewed your research and it has determined the classification of prisoner research and it's issued its approval letter, OHRP will then review what's been approved by the IRB. OHRP must review and concur with the determination of classification of prisoner research as made by the IRB. And then OHRP will issue its approval letter to the IRB concurring with the prisoner research classification as determined by the IRB. And once OHRP has issued its approval letter, then study enrollment may begin. So what happens after the IRB reviews your submission? What are the steps that are taken at OHRP? These next four slides will clarify as much, outlining the steps of a studies review at OHRP. So the IRB serves as the intermediary between the study team and OHRP. So after the IRB's review of the study and they've issued their approval letter, the IRB are the ones that will submit its approval, the approved documents, so namely the protocol and the informed consent, along with a cover letter to OHRP. And of note here, it's been my experience that some IRBs are more transparent about the submission process than others. Um, accordingly, it's prudent to obtain confirmation that the IRB has submitted the materials for OHRP's review. OHRP then reviews the submission, and at the time of its review, it may go back to the IRB with questions. And if that happens, the IRB will likely go back to the lead investigator with OHRP's questions and work in conjunction with the lead team about how to best answer the questions brought forth by OHRP. So after conferring with the lead investigator and the study team, uh, the IRB will respond to OHRP, answering the questions that they have brought forth. Now, OHRP may disagree with the classification of prisoner research as determined by the IRB. And should this occur, OHRP would then advise the IRB why they disagree with the chosen classification of prisoner research. And should that happen, the protocol will then need to be re-reviewed by the IRB, reconsidering the classification of prisoner research as determined by OHRP. Considering OHRP's classification of prisoner research, the IRB will review the materials again as a new protocol review submission. The materials including a newly issued approval letter, which contains the revised categorization of prisoner research, will then go back to OHRP for review and concurrence. As a final step of the certification review process, OHRP then distributes its approval letter to the IRB. The IRB will then distribute the, as much to the lead investigator and to the study team for inclusion in the lead team's regulatory binder. This approval covers all the participating sites of the protocol. In other words, each participating site need not navigate the submission process to OHRP on its own and will not receive its own unique approval letter. The letter that is issued to the lead site 
also covers the participating sites. So included here is the URL and the reference to OHRP's website. Um, and we have wonderful colleagues from across the CTN, including those at the nodes and at participating sites, at MS and NIDA, of course, from whom we all learn and exchange experiences and information. Um, but just pointing out that OHRP, of course, is the official resource for all regulations and requirements on conducting research with prisoners. But just wanted to take the moment uh, to say thank you and that I hope you have found this presentation to be helpful and informative and thank you to everybody for joining today's webinar.